morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another session of very educational lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our distinguished faculty from Brazil, Professor Hang Su Wen. Professor Wen completed his residency program in neurosurgery at the Hospital Das Clinicas, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He did his fellowship in micro neurosurgery at the Instituto Neurologico de Sao Paulo under Dr. Ivan de Oliveira and research fellowship in micro neurosurgery at the University of Florida under Professor Albert Rotten. He earned his PhD degree from the University of Sao Paulo and he was a former clinical assistant professor, Department of Neurosurgery, University of Florida. He is currently the chief of epilepsy surgery program and vascular neurosurgery at the Hospital Das Clinicas, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about the anatomic and geographic surgical correlation of MC aneurysms and its influence on surgical strategy. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from China, Professor Du Zhou Ying. He is a consultant at the Department of Neurosurgery, Hua Shan Hospital of Fudan University, Shanghai Neurosurgical Emergency Center and National Center for Neurological Diseases, China. His clinical interests are focused upon the management of traumatic brain injury, hemorrhagic stroke and neurocritical care. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and today he will be talking about minimally invasive surgery for intracerebral hematoma. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Takayuki Hara. Professor Hara is the Director, Department of Neurosurgery, Toranamon Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. Professor Hara is an active member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society as well as many other international societies. He is an active researcher and was an author included in the Attached to Trial for Intercerebral Hematoma. We are extremely thankful to Professor Hara for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Hang Su Wen today. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Germany, Professor Klaus Dieter Maria Resch. Professor Resch has his medical education from world-renowned neurosurgeons like Professor Yashar Gill and Professor Parneski. He started his work with clinical anatomy and established a surgical simulation concept and training environment. He blossomed and refined endoscopic anatomy for neurosurgery and Professor Parneski and progressed to endoscopic surgical simulation techniques for aneurysms, which later became the basics for endoscopic assisted micro neurosurgery. His, his meritorious careers include many firsts, including introduction of endoscopic ultrasound into minimal invasive neurosurgery to navigate endoscope in complex hydrocephalus. He also developed the ICHU equation concept and technique for minimally invasive neurosurgery. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Du Shou Ying. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and all the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with, it, with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Takayuki Hara. Uh, thank you for giving me a kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Hara from Tokyo, Japan, and uh, I'll chair the first session. And uh, uh, the first speaker uh, is uh, uh, Professor uh, Han Xu Wen from Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, uh, as Dr. Me Raja mentioned, uh, he is a uh, quite famous neurosurgeon in Brazil, and uh, he has trained, has, has been trained in uh, Roton Lab in Florida, and uh, he has uh, quite a lot of experience in anatomy. And uh, it is also clear that without anatomy, we could not do uh, good surgery. So uh, today, uh, I have uh, we a great guest, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, have a good having a good lecture uh, from uh, Professor uh, Wen. So, uh, Professor Wen, please start your lecture. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much for, um, I thank you, uh, Professor Araja, for the invitation, Professor Yoko Kato Shubin, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Hara, for the presentation, uh, my introduction. My presentation today is about, it's about the, um, the correlation between the anatomy and geography and the surgery. Because what happened is, in our daily routine, we have, um, the surgery and then what is the best thing to do is no is go before we go first look at the imaging and then we we already know what like what would we expect to find in the surgery what is the danger what is the place to avoid what is the place to go 
this is uh, because I think that maybe 80 to 85% of the success of a microneurosurgery, the success is achieved outside the OR. It's because of planning the strategy. And then 10 to 15% is the execution of what we have planned in outside OR. So I'm gonna take this kind of example and apply to MCA aneurysms, the influence of the location and projection on our strategy, how to, to approach, how to clip this kind of uh, MCA aneurysms. First, I would like to thank, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, honored to be here, but uh, I have to thank my mentors. They made it possible. They opened the door of a microneurosurgical anatomy for me. Uh, they are, you all know, Dr. Roten passed away six years ago. And uh, Dr. Ivano de Oliveira, he passed, he passed uh, a year ago, but their legacy remains. Okay, now this is the problem. When I was a resident, maybe almost 30 years ago, and, my, and until recently, I still have same kind of questions. So the patient presents to us, presented to us with the um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is her, uh, in the US, uh, MRA, so angio MRI, okay? And then this is AP view. This is a lateral view. This is kind of oblique view. That's okay, this is a routine daily. Then this is the terional craniotomy on the right side. This is a sylvan fissure. Now is the problem. What the problem is? For younger, more, less experienced surgeons, we are gonna all share this kind of feeling. So where is the aneurysm? Is the uh, dome of aneurysm pointing to here, here, here? Where is the aneurysm? I know that the MC aneurysm, it has to be inside the sylvan fissure, but where exactly? The second question is, where should I start splitting the sylvan fissures? Here, 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 where? The third question is, where should I avoid the dissection in order not to hit directly the dome of the aneurysm? So this problem, the real problem has um, taken me back to the lab and make some dissections and try to solve this kind of problem. Where the aneurysm is, where the dome is attached to, where to start dissection. So, what would for your you will have a very experienced uh, neurosurgeon at the audience. So, what are your recommendations for your chief resident? So, this is a problem. In order to know this, we have to remember that the sylvan fissure is present in two surfaces of the brain. Sylvan fissure is one part of sylvan fissure stays on the basal surface and one part of sylvan fissure stays on the lateral surface. So sylvan fissure occupies two surfaces of the brain, one basal, one lateral. What do we have as a salsae gyri over the basal surface? that is involved in the anatomy of the sylvan fissure here on the basal surface. Orbital gyra, posterior, lateral, medial, anterior is less related, but the lateral, posterior, medial are related to the anatomy of the sylvan fissure on the basal surface. And how about the temporal lobe? The plenum polare, or the tip of the temporal lobe is related to the anatomy of the sylvan fissure. Very good. But this is only the superficial part. We do this kind of surgery, right? But once we open the superficial part, we gotta fall into the deep part, still on the basal surface. What are, what is the, what are the contents of the sylvan fissure at this, this at here? What we have is the, uh, the M1, the MCA, and also the deep sylvan vein. But what are the uh, neural structures behind the deep part of the basal surface, the basal component of the sylvan fissure? We, have, we can look at this. We have 
we have this region with a lot of uh, red dots, blue dots, and then there's not, no dots over here. So what are these structures? This is interperforated substance. This is the in, interpole of the insula. And this is a famous lemon insula. If we split, we open, remove the posterior orbital gyrus, we're gonna see the anterior surface of the insula. What do you want to tell us? What I want to tell you guys is, if we see the M1 here, I will ask you, what is the neural structure located behind the M1 here? You will see, oh, behind the, the proximal segment of M1, what's behind and above is gonna be the interperforated substance. And what's behind the, the distal half of M1 is gonna be insula. What is above the distal half of insula over here? Oh, above the distal half of M1, insula. What's above the proximal half of the M1, interperforated substance? What's located below the M1 temporal lobe? This is very important, anatomical relationship. We're gonna come back to this topic again, okay? This part of basal surface. Now let's move on to the lateral surface. So Sylvan Fisher occupies basal and lateral surface of the brain. We all know the superficial part is composed of the horizontal, enter horizontal, enter ascending, uh, and then posterior rami of the um, posterior ramus of the Sylvan Fisher. And we all know that this is the pars orbitalis, triangularis, you see the triangle shaped, the pars opercularis, precentral, postcentral, and then supermarginal gyrus. We have to memorize this. Okay? And then what happens is inside this region, this is going to be insula hidden by the frontal and parietal opercular. If we remove the frontal and parietal opercular, we're going to see branch insula and also branches of M2, the MCA. What happened is, you know, you can see that, you know, that um, the inferior trunk runs on the inferior limiting sulcus of insula. This is the inter limiting sulcus of insula. And this is the, the loop that M2 will make at the superior limiting sulcus of insula. So what do we want to, what, what's the message, take home message? The, this triangle depict showed by the branches of MCA is showing the shape of the insula. That is the external coverage of the central core. What is central core? Basal ganglia plus thalamus plus internal, ex external and string capsules. The whole thing is central core. Can we look at the Sylvan triangle and, and tell where is the uh, central core? Of course, that's the reason I am presenting here, okay? Now let's go to the MCA aneurysms, okay? This, what determined the morphology of Sylvan fissure is not the frontal lobe, it's not the parietal lobe, it's the temporal lobe. We know the temporal lobe presents four surfaces. One is the superior, it's related to the sylvan fissure. One is a lateral, one is basal, and one is a medial, medial part, okay? So today we're gonna talk about the superior part. What do we have the superior part of uh, the temporal, so superior part of the, the temporal lobe? We can see that in this region, the most posterior part is a flat, a flat surface, and is the triangular area and flat. This is called the plenum temporale. It's larger on the, usually on the left side on the dominant hemisphere, okay? And then this is flat, remember this. And then enter to this flat surface, we're gonna see the Hessius gyrus or anterior transverse temporal gyrus. You see at this point, Hessius gyrus runs from anterior to posterior lateral to medial. And that this external part of, most anterior part of uh, Hesher's gyrus is going to meet the superior, tempora, superior temporal gyrus. Is it important? Very important. We're going to see that on angiogram later. And the medial part of Hesher's gyrus is the, is, is the place where the sylvian point 
the intergraphic Sylvan point is located. Sylvan point is by definition, the last loop of MCA before exiting the Sylvan fissure, okay? We're gonna see all this. Pay attention because by looking at the Sylvan point, we know where the, the pulvinar of the thalamus is located. We know where the atrium is located, okay? When dealing with aneurysm, what we want as surgeon, I want to reach to the aneurysm as quick as possible to establish the proximal control. What, do, what else do I want? I want to avoid the fundus or the dome of the aneurysm and, and consequently avoid the premature rupture of the aneurysm. So we need to know the exact location of this aneurysm. This is my experience until the, before the pandemic, a little bit more than 300 cases. So, but most of them are around the uh, M1 and the region of genu of NCA. So I'm gonna focus on this part. So this is, this is what we see, AP view, frontal view of the uh, left, in this case, left carotid artery system. Okay, we can see obviously carotid artery, M1, and then this is the genu of the MCA. So my question is, just exercise for a Saturday morning here in Brazil, sunny morning. If, look, if we divide the M1 into two halves, proximal half and a distal half, and then genu, I will ask you a question. Okay, proximal half is from here, bifurcation to here. If aneurysm is pointing up, what would, you, would be your recommendation for your chief resident when he's starting his first cases, you know, first cases of MCA aneurysm? If it is pointing up, what do you think th these branches are? These are the, the lenticular right arteries, the lateral lenticular right arteries. It is pointing, if the aneurysm is pointing up, you have to ask your, tell your chief resident, be careful because, there might be some perforators around the aneurysm area. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, change. So aneurysm pointing down at the proximal half. What would be your recommendation for your chief resident? Pointing down, we're gonna see that it's attached to the temporal lobe. So avoid dissecting sylvan fissure towards the temporal lobe, dissect the sylvan fissure towards the, front, the frontal side of sylvan fissure. And then you reach the aneurysm, okay? This is just a few examples, but let's go deep into this topic. So where's the aneurysm? To what structure it is related or attached to, okay? Okay, this example I already gave you. Aneurysm pointing up. So if we divide the proximal, the proximal half and distal half, aneurysm pointing up, the proximal half, we already said that it's attached to the anteroperative substance. Aneur distal M1, aneurysm pointing up, it's gonna be related to what? We just talked about that, the anter surface of the insula. So there's no perforator over there. Recommendations are different. Proximal half, M1, point, uh, pointing down. We're gonna look at it later, but here we're talking about pointing up, right? Pointing up, proximal half, interperforated substance. Distal half, pointing up, insula. Why? Look, this is basal view, carotid artery, M1, genu. Proximal half, distal half. Pointing up proximal half is what? What is this flat surface? This is anteroperiphery substance. Okay, distal half pointing up. What is this part of the brain? Insula. Here, lenticular ray arteries. Here, nothing, just insula. So take home message. M1 segment pointing up at the proximal half, anteroperiphery substance. At the distal half, anterior surface of insula. Anderson pointing down, M1 proximal half, M1 distal half, pointing down proximal half. It's gonna be 
attached to what structure? Ancus. Distal half pointing down. Aneurysm would be attached to where? To the temporal pole, the tip of temporal lobe or the temporal lobe. So take home message, pointing down, M1 proximal, uncus, M1 distal, temporal pole. M1 aneurysm pointing anteriorly. So instead of going up, instead of going down, it is pointing anteriorly. So what do you think? What be the structure attached to the dome of aneurysm? What it would be your recommendation for your chief resident? Pointing anteriorly, what do you think this is? This structure is pointing anteriorly. The aneurysm at the proximal half will be attached or very close to the lesser wing of sphenoid. Here, distal half pointing anteriorly. Aneurysm will be very close or even attached to the sphenoid bone. So what would be your recommendation for your chief resident? Be careful at even at the craniotomy. When you start to, to bite off, run jewel off, to run jewel, you know, the sphenoid bone, if aneurysm is attached to that, you might, you know, rupture the aneurysm prematurely or carefully open the dura because aneurysm pointing anteriorly might be attached to the dura if it's big enough. So if you open the dura carelessly, and then you may cause the premature rupture, even not even knowing about the location of the dome of aneurysm. Okay, so this is a superior view. We're looking from above, down, orbit, right orbit, sphenoid bone, aneurysm, proximal half, distal half, pointing anteriorly, pointing anteriorly. Be careful even at the early stage of the craniotomy or careful when you open the dura. So take home message, M1 aneurysm pointing anteriorly, lesser ring sphenoid, opercular frontal, but the most dangerous is the bone. When it is attached to the bone, be careful even at the craniotomy. M1 proximal, M1 distal, pointing back. So pointing back at M proximal M1 will be attached to what? What is this structure here? You know what? I could understand the anatomy by looking at angiogram. That's why I made this like, section like 25 years ago. And then I realized, oh, now I start to understand the angiography because here, what is in the aneurysm pointing back is attached to what? To the ancus. This still half of M1, aneurysm pointing back is related to what? Insular pole. This is a, you know, just take advantage of the, the um, advantage of the slide. This is the sylvan point. This is the sylvan point. This is proximal. Which one is the last one? Is this one? Is here or here? In the angi on the angiogram, everything that is superior means posterior. So this one is the last one, not this one. So by looking at here, what you can tell me about the angiogram? So by looking at the sylvan point, I know where the atrium is located. What is the anterior wall of the atrium? The anterior wall of the atrium is the povidon of the thalamus, is the crital plexus we call glomus, and also the cruise of the fornix. So they are all here, atrium, povidon of the thalamus, and also the medial end of the hashes jar is over here. Another question, why, why is this branch making curve making this kind of loop and why is this branch go you know why is this branch goes flat you know flat exiting the sylvan fissure this one curves down if the, the branch is flat it is located at the plenum temporale far back if it can make a loop it is located at the hashes gyrus or anterior to hashes gyrus another question this, we have a series of loops of MCA over here. What is location of this loop? This loop stays at the first, at the anterior limiting sulcus of insula, okay? This is a very important. So take home message for aneurysm arising from 
pointing back. What is it? If it is pointing back at the mu m proximal half of m1, it will be attached to the uncus. Careful when you dissect the fissure. Leave the temporal temporal part later. Go through the frontal side. Anderson pointing back at the distal half of M1, it will be attached to the insula, okay? Aneurysm rising at the genu, this region. What is the anatomy involved in this region? Look at here. What do we have here? Usually aneurysm rising here, the M1 is straight, and then usually the aneurysm will be pointing laterally. Pointing laterally, it's going to be attached to this part of the brain, of the temporal lobe. What part of the temporal lobe it is? This is obviously superior temporal gyrus, but this is a very particular place of the temporal lobe. This is the, this is the vertical part of plenum polari, and then continues entering as the horizontal part of the plenum polari. The horizontal part is also called the tip of the temporal lobe. So aneurysm arising at the genu of the MCA and pointing either laterally or either laterally and down, either laterally or up will be mostly probably involved attached to the vertical wall of the plenum polar. Means what? It means that you have to avoid the dissecting sylvan fissure at the temporal side of sylvan fissure. Go stay on the frontal side of sylvan fissure. This is what I was talking about. This is anterior, this is a plan. All this is a plenum polari. This is rhinosulcus. So plenum polari starts from the hashagyrus, anteriorly, first vertical, and then horizontal until it reaches the rhinosulcus. So aneurysm rising at the genu of the MCA is usually attached to here, this part of the brain. So where is the aneurysm in my surgery? So now I know the anatomy, I know how to understand the angiography and know anatomically where is the aneurysm, my MCA aneurysm. Now the second question is, how can I find it? in my surgery. One is outside OR, now I'm in OR. So I was thinking about what is the best landmark on the brain surface that I can, I can estimate, that, can allow, that will allow me to estimate the location of the aneurysm. So what is the easiest part of the brain around the sylvan fissure to be recognized intraoperatively? For me, it's the tip of the pars triangularis by far. So I went to the lab and study what is the relationship between the pars triangularis and the genu. Do you know why? I was thinking about this. If I know where the genu is, if I know, if I know where the carotid is, for instance, I, I usually ask my residents to start opening the carotid cistern, not only to release CSF, to, to relax the brain, but also to see where the carotid artery is. So wh why, why is that necessary? Because if I know where the genu is projected on the surface of the brain, I know where the carotid artery is. I know where's the M1, entire extent of the M1 is located. And then I can tell if aneurysm is located at the proximal half, if aneurysm is located at the distal half, or even if the aneurysm is located at the genu, I have control of it. So I know now I know where the carotid artery is, but I don't know where the genu is unless I open the sylvan fissure. But I want to know before opening the sylvan fissure. So let's go back to this slide. Tip of the pars triangulus here. See, this is the genu of MCA. Always genius, genius of NCA is located a little bit proximal, anterior to the tip of pars triangularis. Okay. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, but where is pars triangularis on this angiogram? That's another question. 
So what do you guys think? Where is the part triangularis projected here on this AP view? If I just told you, you know, what just told you here, Jenny of MCA is here, tip of part triangularis is here. This distance in this specimen was about eight millimeters. But with my surgical experience, I have never seen they stayed at the same level. They can stay very close, but genius always enter to the tip, projection of the tip of part stranglers. So I was thinking, if I know, if I know, if I know where the part strangularis is, I would know immediately where the genuine of the MCA is located. If I know the location of carotid artery by opening the carotid system, I know the, the location here, I know the location of the genuine, so I can estimate always where the aneurysm is. And also by looking at, you know, pointing up, pointing down, pointing forward, pointing, pointing backward, I know what the structure I should avoid. So if an is pointing down, it's attached to the temporal lobe. I go and split on the frontal side of the silver fish and so on, okay? So where is pars triangularis in this angiogram? It's here. So every time you have an like in here, distal after the genu, you're right on top of it if you are looking at the pars triangularis. But how can I recognize pars triangularis in my surgery? That's the most, that's easier fecal message. Pars triangularis, just the distal to the genu of MCA. And also we have to remember, this is a picture taken from uh, adapted uh, drawing from Professor Yashargo's book on angiogram in red, aneurysm pointing anteriorly in surgery, the patients in, in, in this position, the aneurysm will be pointing up. Aneurysm pointing up on angiography will be pointing backwards. So because patients lay down, you have to, you have to think everything you see on angiogram in surgery is 90 degrees backwards. Okay, aneurysm pointing down as in yellow here in surgery will, point, will be pointing forward. This is a very, very important message. This was depicted by Professor Yashargo many, many years ago and still worked very well until today, at least for me. This is not only, a, not only a, can be a, a, a applied to the, the MC aneurysm, this is for everything, for two more, for other kinds of aneurysms, and we have to think this way. Okay, just as a quick exercise to show you. This is aneurysm, it's pointing down, right? Yeah, it's pointing down, okay? Uh, this is, uh, around here will be the genuine. So this probably at the, is located as a transition between the proxima M1 and distal M1. But pointing down, it is pointing toward the temporal lobe. So what would be your recommendation for your chief resident? Split the sylvan fissure, open the carotid artery, um, not carotid artery, carotid cistern. You'll see where the carotid artery is. Pars triangularis over here. So we know where the pars triangularis is. We know where the carotid artery is. We know that this aneurysm is far away from where we start, usually start splitting silver and fissure. We start splitting at the tip of pars triangularis. Why? Because at that location, the subarachnoid space is larger. It's easier to split from there. So you can go, but once you reach the, the turning point, the basal surface, you stay away from the temporal side. You dissect toward the frontal side. Okay, so this is the picture of that, injury, uh, the, uh, that patient. This is the tip of pars triangularis. So my question is, where is the genu of the MCA? Genu of the MCA will be around here. Obviously, it's deeper, more proximal. Where's carotid artery? Carotid artery will be here. So estimate the distance from the carotid artery to the genu. That aneurysm is even proximal, a little bit proximal than the half distance between the carotid and the genu of MCA. So aneurysm will be 
obviously deep on the basal surface and pointing. If Anderson's pointing down on angiography, on, in surgery, it's going to be pointing forward. So towards the temporal lobe. So it enters will be here and pointing forward. So let's see, this is interoperative picture. Um, Sylvan Frisch was split only, part strangler is over here. So this is optic nerve left. This is a carotid artery, A1, M1. This is the genius over here, I didn't split. The, 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 the whole extent of sylvan fissure. And this is aneurysm pointing towards the temporal lobe. And this is a big vein running over it. So this is the anatomic angiograph. This is after clipping. You don't have to see the video. Okay, obviously we have to careful, be careful. Always aneurysm would be erased in front of bifurcation. So if you clip and then go home, no, no, no. It's not good. You have to check. And there's always a, another branch. You have the side M1. There is, we have the uh, early branch from temporal lobe to the temporal lobe. So you have to always check bifurcation. Okay, another example. Subarect the intraventricular hemorrhage with a slight, actually not only intraventricular, but also subarachnoid hemorrhage with a slight um, dilation of the ventricle. This is... Um, a CTA of the patient. We can see uh, the carotid artery here on the left side. We can barely see M1, maybe spasm, I don't know, but that we, then we see an aneurysm over here pointing down. This is carotid bifurcation. This is the extent, this is genuine of MC. So this is a proximal half, this is a distal half. So for me, this aneurysm is arising from the proximal half of M1 and pointing down. So proximal half one pointing down, it, it will be attached to what its structure? This aneurysm, this is a lateral view, left side, you see L, aneurysm pointing down, or a little bit pointing forward, doesn't matter. Pointing down, predominantly down. Proximal half will be attached to the uncus. So what would be your recommendation? Split, you can open the carotid system, you can open the sylvan fissure, but at the basal surface, stay on the frontal side, and then you dissect the, the aneurysm. We don't have to see the um, video, that's fine. This is the intraoperative phot photograph. You can see the optic nerve, left one. This is anticlinoid process. This is carotid artery. Okay, this is M A1, this is M1, this is aneurysm attached to the uncus, okay? Aneurysm, this one, pointing, apparently it's pointing forward, anteriorly. This is a bif carotid bifurcation. Genu is over here. This is, I would say, probably at, this is a bifurcation. This is probably a half distance between the distal half and the proximal half and pointing anteriorly. What would be the recommendation for your chief resident? Predominantly pointing anterior. This is the lateral view. Point, pointing anteriorly means close to the bone, the, the lesser wing sphenoid. Okay. So pointing anteriorly in the angiogram in surgery is going to be pointing up towards you. So careful with the craniotomy careful when you open the dura. This is the, the after the craniotomy, right side, frontal, temporal, sylvan fissure, tip of the parastrangularis. That aneurysm is proximal, sorry. That aneurysm is proximal, genius over here, it's proximal, okay? So it's located, it is located at the basal surface, but it's pointing up. So it's, the genu will be here. So this aneurysm will be here around this area and pointing up. So if it is pointing up, can I just go ahead and dissect the superficial part of sylvan fissure all the way? No, because the, aneurysm will, the dome of aneurysm will be waiting here. If you split superficially, you might rupture the aneurysm. So what will be the strategy here? Open a little bit and then just go down, go deep. 
in the inside the sylvan fissure. You get the M1 when it comes, it comes up. Don't go superficially. You might rupture. You certainly will rupture the aneurysm. Go split a little bit here and then go down. So this is what we see. This is the um, M1. This is the uh, frontal branch, superior trunk, inferior trunk. The whole, this whole thing, this whole thing is the aneurysm. Attach the superficial sylvan vein here. So you go first down to so secure the proximal control, then you split the uh, superficial part, okay? And then we, I, I did this with two clips, that's okay. Then, and so on, we have so many. Now you know anatomy. Now you know the correlation between the anatomy and the angiography. And then you just play around with the cases. You know, you, you, I, I like to ask my residents where, you know, before doing the surgery, tell me what this angiogram is telling us. And then I will re, re, advise them to study. Um, okay, now, and going back to Anderson. Now, how about this one? This one, M1 is straight, it's not making any curve. By carotid bifurcation, this is located at the, the genu, it's pointing laterally. Where do you expect to find this aneurysm? By inspecting to find this over here. So to what structure this will be attached? To the temporal lobe, to the vertical part of the, the plenum polari. So this is that surgery, so it's surgery of that angiogram, tem left temporal, left frontal lobe, and starting to split the sylvan fissure superficial part. This is unruptured, so see it's very nice uh, sylvan fissure to be split, a huge space. I know that around, I started opening through here. So the aneurysm located at the genu is just a little bit in front, proximal to the tip of pars triangularis. So I'm expecting to find the aneurysm. I, I started splitting here. So genu will be around here, just proximal. So I already see the aneurysm. I don't have to split the whole thing, okay? And then you see the dome of aneurysm. I don't see the dome because it is attached, it's hidden. Hidden by what? This is the vertical part of the plenum polari. So I know that. That's why I I I don't avoid I don't I avoid to retract the temporal lobe. Okay, and then because this is a rupture, so I separate, I dissected the dome away from the plenum polari. You should not do this when the aneurysm is ruptured. Okay, and then proximal control will be here superior trunk, inferior trunk. It's an easy case, but it's, it shows very well. You know, aneurysm is attached to the, we don't have to see this. Um, okay, another case at the genu. M1, aneurysm pointing laterally. How about this? What is the difference between this one, this one, this aneurysm that is located on the, at the genu from this one. Don't look at the AP view, look at the, the lateral view. You see this one, the aneurysm is very close to the supraclinoid carotid artery. It's protected, projected close. Now let's see the, this case. This is also, it's very similar to that one on AP view, but look at here. This is a lateral view. you see how far away is this aneurysm is from the supraclinoid carotid artery. That the previous case, the aneurysm was over here, the projection on the lateral view. What is the meaning of this? That means that this, this aneurysm is not hidden by the temporal lobe. This aneurysm is hidden by the frontal lobe. You see, this is aneurysm. 
This is the inferior trunk, superior trunk is here. The dome of Aeneas is hidden here underneath the pars orbitalis. So whenever you have uh, uh, Aeneas arising from the genu of NCA, pay attention not only on the AP view, pay attention also to the lateral view. If Aeneas is right above, very far away from the supraclinoid carotid artery, it might be attached to the, the uh, pars orbitalis, okay? Why it should not, it should not be so, and before asking this, so let's go back to the very first case I showed you. So now where's the aneurysm? From AP view, you see aneurysm is located at the genu. On the lateral view, it is kind of close. So I'm sure that this aneurysm is close and is attached to the vertical part of planum pilari. And that was pars triangularis over here. I'll start splitting the sylvan fissure through here. So once again, the tip of pars triangularis will be here. Genu will be in this area. The aneurysm will be, atta will be attached to the temporal lobe. Um, just quickly, you see, this is um, M1. Aneurysm attached to the temporal lobe. Inferior trunk is over here. Superior trunk is over here. All we have to do is, is dissect. We don't have to split like why, uh, what I did for the, the previous case and ruptured case. You should not separate. It's not advisable, at least, to separate, to dissect, to expose the whole dome of the, uh, the fundus of the aneurysm, because this is a ruptured case. So then do it. And this is the clipping, okay? Okay, to, in, to finalize my talk for this morning, um, 42 minutes now, what, uh, the residents and young neurosurgeons will ask, do you recommend any book, or any paper to read? I recommend uh, this book from Dr. Rotten, obviously, and all the, um, the, the, pre, the articles, the papers on anatomy, that uh, have been published by this uh, Dr. Rotten's lab over more than 40 years. The papers are more complete than this book, but this, if I don't have time, please go to this book and you'll be fine. And uh, if you want very, uh, you know, you want to, to see the, this anatomical and geographic and uh, surgical correlation, uh, we had a chance to publish this uh, in the Neurosurgery 2009, and in which I tell, uh, I show this the same, same philosophy I just show you guys. And uh, I had a chance to publish in Japan 2012, this exactly you know, anatomic and geographic surgical correlation. Because why in Japan? Because my, my Japanese brother, uh, my partner at Gainesville, when I was Dr. Roten's fellow, his name is Toshiro Katsuta. At that time, he was uh, the editor of uh, the journal. And for those are interest, who are interested in anatomy, I had a chance to be the first author. Uh, we wrote a the book chapter for the last four editions of Human's Neurological Surgery, always chapter two, in which we talk about surgical anatomy of the brain, not only about the arteries, the MCA, uh, we talk about the neural structures, the vascular structures. And I had a chance, and in the, this is the newest edition, I had a chance to, to write and put more surgical application of the anatomy. And uh, before Dr. Uh, Evandro passed away last year, I asked his permission to show 33 of his best videos in this chapter. So I have included 67 videos. Among them, 33 are from Dr. Evandro de Oliveira. The, he handpicked the, his best videos and I, I asked his permission. So if you, if, if you want to, you don't have to see my surgery, but you, if you want to see a surgery of a legend, please go to Newman's chapter two. You see here, Evandro de Oliveira. And then this is an example if you want to see far lateral approach for pike aneurysm, and transmedullary fissure approach, transcavernous approach to the basal, all kinds of surgeries, microsurgery surgery in the brain, you can find it. 
So this is um, six to seven videos. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor for me. You know, I was born in Taiwan, but I, I grew up in Brazil. I've been in Brazil for the 48 years and 58. So when I was 10, we moved to Brazil. I'm very grateful I miss uh, Asia. I am great, very grateful to Brazil and very grateful to um, ACNS, Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Grateful to Raja Kuti, Professor Raja Kuti, Yoko Kato, uh, Shubin, and also Professor Hara for his kind introduction. Thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Han Shu Bing. Uh, we could learn so much about uh, MCA aneurysm and uh, anatomical uh, landmarks. And uh, it was quite uh, impressive for me that uh, uh, we can get um, better outcome uh, with uh, preoperative good surgical simulation. And, uh, how to uh, make uh, uh, 3D uh, angiography uh, using 2D uh, conventional images. And uh, uh, he showed how to reconstruct uh, these 2D images into 3D images in our brains. And also he showed how to uh, uh, reconstruct these angiography images onto the brain. So uh, I uh, could run on the relationship be between uh, past triangles and the region of the genu. It was quite uh, uh, informative for me. So uh, I have some questions. Uh, first, um, when you dissect the uh, Sylvia Fisher, uh, according to your video and the uh, pictures, you always from start from the fr frontal side, not from the temporal side of the cerebellum vein. Uh, cerebellum vein. And how, how, how do you think about the relationships of the uh, cerebellum vein and the uh, annual vein? You, you don't mention the uh, cerebellum veins in this presentation. How do you think about the relationships and vein and uh, aneurysms? Okay. Um, you know, why? No, not always, but um, usually this superficial silver vein will drain toward the temporal side, toward the, you know, the, um, the sinus, sphenoparietal sinus. So if, if the large veins, the sylvan, superficial sylvan veins draining toward the temporal side, it's illogical to split sylvan fissure on the frontal side so we can spare the vein. But sometimes, superficial sylvan vein does not go to the sphenoparietal sinus. It goes to the frontal side. And then in this case, I will start from the temporal side of the sylvan fissure to split to spear the uh, sylvan vein. So most of times, yes, I go through the frontal side, but it depends on the location of the drainage of the sylvan, uh, superficial sylvan vein. That's the reason. But so you have you to can... look, each case is different. Uh -huh. So you can also get the uh, images from angiography about the venous drainage system perioperatively, not only the arterial images, but also the uh, venous drainage system with the angiography. And you decide which side is better, frontal side or temporal side. Actually, um, I see intraoperatively. Mm. You finally decide. Just by, yes, that. yes. You make a craniotomy, you see, oh, this vein is going to the temporal lobe. So I dissect well, through the frontal. Oh, mm -hmm. this vein is going to the frontal side. I dissect to the temp. I, I don't look at the angiogram. It's easier to just look after opening the dura and mm -hmm. see and, and decide at the, the surgery. Okay, I thank you. And also you mentioned uh, first you recognize the internal carotid artery and uh, the region of the genu and uh, estimate uh, how the MC runs uh, in, inside the cerebral fissure. So you always open the carotid system and during, especially in the ruptured cases, you first attack to the carotid system and uh, recognize how, how, where is the carotid artery and also back to the uh, genu and uh, attack to the animals. Is it right? Is it right? Yes, it is correct. You know, over the years, if you, we already know if you, you, if you do a lot of uh, terrional cases, you know, you know where the carotid artery is. But for a teaching purpose for my resident, 
they are asking always open split the um, the crowd system, relax the brain. So we have we know where the crowd is. Mm -hmm. And then I don't even have to split the sylvan fissure just by look, looking at the brain. I know where the part strangular is. I know already where the genuine is, even without looking at it. So I know where the car karate is. I know where the part strangular is. I know where genuine is. And I look at the angiogram. This is this is proximal half of M1. So I have more distance. Just don't be afraid and go. Mm. The problem is when I was young, I didn't know where the energy is. It's here, it's here, it's here. So I was always very afraid all the way. And then I didn't understand if energy is attached to the temporal side, frontal side. I didn't understand anything at all. Just I know that this in the aneurysm is over around this area somewhere. Now, what I have learned with the anatomy is now I know more precisely where the aneurysm is. Okay, so the uh, success uh, rate is higher, much higher. I don't remember very well. Um, the last case with uh, uh, premature rupture. Mm. So it's very safe, you know, prevent premature rupture if you know exactly where the aneurysm is located. Okay, thank you so much. And the uh, time is coming. So uh, thank you again for giving me a, a very excellent uh, lecture. Uh, thank you, Professor Wendu uh, Win. And I uh, give it my chair to uh, Raja Sensei. Please continue. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Professor Hang Suben and Professor Takayuki Hara. It was one of the brilliant lectures I have ever heard regarding surgical anatomy of MCI aneurysms. I'm extremely grateful to you for presenting this on the webinar. If we may take one or two questions. Yes, Liu Bun Seng, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thanks Raja. Thanks Professor for a very exciting lecture where we now uh, relate the vessel towards the surface anatomy that we see. Uh, my, may I ask, Professor, because in my center, uh, we differentiate between rupture and, ru and ruptured MC aneurysm. For us, unruptured, we always come from CVN. But however, uh, for ruptured aneurysm, uh, we always try to come from subfrontal because uh, mainly, uh, except those are pointing outward, we have no problem to retract the frontal lobe. And then we can uh, always identify the proximal early. And uh, secondly, we can always protect the perforator going towards the, the deep structure. Uh, what is your opinion regarding this approach, Professor? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, uh, years before I understanding, I understand this correlation, I was thinking just like, what do you think? You know, if I go more subfrontal, I would get to the, um, the proximal control earlier. But, you know, for I will give you an example. Aneurysm pointing anteriorly on angiogram. For an aneurysm to be pointing anteriorly, M1 has to be curved. It's impossible if, for M1 to be straight and aneurysm pointing anteriorly. No. If, aneur if M1 is straight, well, aneurysm will, will be always pointing laterally. Okay. What, what do you want to want to what do you want to reach from with this affirmation? So with statement. So aneurysm pointing anteriorly, M1 always has to curve back and then curve anteriorly. Then what happens? If you put the patient in surgical position, aneurysm curving back means curving down. You don't have to go and dig in, down to get that part of the M1. It curves in, posteriorly, M1. Posteriorly, then anteriorly. Anteriorly means up. So my strategy is not, you know, it's very difficult to go subfrontal always if aneurysm is more proximal. If you see, you can see the same, the same thing applied in anatomy for the aneurysm, we can apply for M1. M1 going up, I don't have to go through. I just go deep. I don't have to go proximal. I just go from distal, but go deep. And I will see the, the M1 going up. That's my proximal control. So the answer for your question is, look at each case, the morphology of M1, where the aneurysm is located. If you can find a more comfortable way to reach 
and get the proximal control and stay away from the aneurysm. That's the, 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 the key point. So after knowing this kind of correlation, I am not concerned that much about going proximal subfrontal or it's in, always transylvian and go to the opposite side of the aneurysm. So if it is pointing to the temporal lobe, don't go to the temporal lobe, go to the frontal lobe. Aneurysm pointing to the frontal lobe, go to the temporal side. Aneurysm, very superficial. You have to identify, that's the most dangerous ones. You know, very superficial. If you, you, if you don't know, you just go and split, you will rupture the aneurysm 100%. So aneurysm pointing up, that means M1, it has to go up. So you, you, you split, you go deep immediately inside the sylvan fish. You get proximal control from here. You don't get from here anteriorly. So yeah, I, I think, there, you know. Yeah, I agree, Prof. Uh, there, there's another way that we always do, uh, especially in a long M MCA branch, as, as you said, it, it uh, curve posteriorly. Sometimes we will do a segmental opening of the civet. So from medial laterally, so we will first open the proximal part especially those near to the temporal pole, we will go near to the temporal pole rather than follow the curve. So uh, we do not always uh, uh, expose the whole track of MCRT, the aneurysm. What's your opinion regarding this, Prof? You know, once again, as long as, for instance, aneurysm distal, very close to the genu, or even distal to the genu, it's right on, you're right under where we start splitting silver fissure. That's dangerous too. You have to be aware of that. But, um, you know, uh, this is just an anatomical and geographical discussion strategy. It will depend on each the experience of each surgeon. You know, I'm, I'm saying that this is the only way, this is the correct way. No, no, no. I'm just showing where, how to estimate the location of aneurysm, how to avoid danger, and then how you operate, you know, it's up to you, up to your experience. The thing is, what is the safest way for you? Maybe not the safest way for me. So I don't think this, there is an absolutely correct answer for this surgical strategy. I am open, you know, for this. Very well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. Thank has you very much. His hand. Yes, Ben. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Ben. Uh, nice to oh, yes. let you again. And I still Thank remember you. how you question uh, us. Uh, in your in your in your in your dissection course in Mayo Clinic, and congratulations to your latest uh, uh, latest uh, dissection course as well. So my question is: In your last series of the MC uh, aneurysm, do you encounter some aneurysm that is uh, not too big but uh, calcified that the clip uh, cannot close completely? Uh, because I I I. Do encounter this uh, situation, and uh, sometimes there is some uh, vestigial flow on uh, ICG, small amount, but uh, not too much. So, uh, how to you teach your residents about uh, how to maximize the force of the clip on the aneurysm, and any tips on uh, those uh, difficult situations? Oh, well, uh, thank you so much for your question. You know, um, this is another topic. You know, what we just talked about was the, how to locate the aneurysm, how to avoid the, the dome. You know, for the complex, large cases, calcified, that's a different thing. That's another topic. What I would go is to, uh, obviously, before the surgery, we analyze the CT also. So already know, oh, the, cal the calcified part is the, here, it's very close, where usually it's not so close to the, the neck because of the flow inside the aneurysm, usually it's not that close to the neck, but you have to be careful because if you, I have the bad experience by clipping the calcified part, include with the clip and the wall ruptured. You see the wall is not the wall anymore. The wall is concrete, it's calcified. How can you repair this? So you have to put the clip more very close to the parent artery. So I, I can tell you, just open aneurysm and remove the cal cal you know, calcified part. This is not so easy because time is running. You have to put a temporary clip for this. So I would say that what is the safest thing? If you, I, my, I, I, I want my patient to do well. If I leave just small of residual neck, that's okay. You know, 
I have never seen, you know, small residual neck and then the patient bleeds, you know, like uh, 10 years later. I have never seen, at least in my experience. So if patient would do well, if you leave a small residual neck, it's okay. It's not like the most important thing is patients doing well. It's not, you know, to be very pretty on post-op angiogram. No, no, this is secondary. The first priority is patient. Well, thank, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful answer. Uh, one, uh, I would like to suggest, Ben, that if your clips are not closing well, you use a fenestrated clip which has a higher closing force than a normal ones. You may sometimes get away with that. So we'll come back to our closing. And But before that, I would like to ask Professor Wen one question. Okay. Most of the... Uh, MC aneurysm ruptures that we encounter in our place are surrounded with a moderate size hematoma. What is your strategy when you deal with such? Any tips for us that you can give us? Okay. Um, oh, thank you for your question. Um, we always do like a standard procedure, like a craniotomy for a um, uh, patient with huge hematoma, big hematoma. Usually we do larger craniotomy. That's the first thing. And then we go to the vessel systems to drain CSF as much as possible to relax the brain. Why? Because I don't want to evacuate the, the, the hematoma before having the proximal control. You know, mm -hmm. this is because it's obvious. If you, it's easier, just go and, and try to evacuate a little bit of hematoma, but sometimes it can rupture the aneurysm and you don't have proximal control. So what we do routinely is go to the carotid system, drain CSF. If possible, we'll go to the interpeduncular system because sometimes you open the carotid system, there's no CSF, nothing. And then you have to go more deeper to reach the interpeduncular system. Then there's always CSF there. And if possible, it's not so easy, you can go to the lamina terminalis. And then if you, do, if you did all this, the brain still like this huge swollen with manitol and all kinds of things, you have to try to split a little bit of sylvan fissure, try to get to the proximal control. For this, you have to understand the anatomy. But in order to have a big hematoma, temporal or usually temporal frontal hematoma, for the temporal side, the aneurysm has to be a little bit more distal at the at least at the genu. If you if you can go back to your series, pay attention. What aneurysms for MC aneurysms will cause uh, most likely to cause temporal hematoma, not the one over the proximal half of M1. It's over the distal or even at the genu. Usually at the genu. Ah, but uh, some aneurysm can cause frontal hematoma. I agree, and then that's a different thing. So. Drain CSF, interpeduncular system, carotid system, lamina terminalis, terminalis. Brain is more or less okay. Do the normal way. I, I would do this normal way because I already know where the aneurysm is. No, the brain is still huge. You cannot operate anything. I would still try to split to fissure. You may you might injure, you know, subapial here, there, but you know where the aneurysm is, you can go straight to the proximal control. Okay, nothing of this was possible. Brains was like a huge mountain. Then you have to, to remove a little bit of uh, hematoma and see what happens to relax the brain. But that's the last alternative I would do. I would do everything possible to relax the brain or at least to get to the proximal control if you know where the aneurysm is. Thank you. Thank you very much for that brilliant answer. And with that, we come to the conclusion. And I would like to invite Professor Takayuki Hara to say the final remark before we go on to the second session. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we could get a very good discussion about MC aneurysm treatment. So uh, from now on, we have another step to do uh, the MC aneurysm surgery. Uh, using uh, his great lectures. Thank you for the audience. Thank you for the professor. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I understand it might be a working day for you. If you will be staying back to hear the second session, Professor Wen and Professor Hara. Of course. Right. Thank you very much. So I would okay. like to invite Professor Kles Ross to say the introduction part about MIS surgery and invite Professor Dushoin for his lecture. Professor Kles, Kles Ross, all yours. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you. It's very uh, exciting. Uh, and uh, the thematic we have to talk now uh, by the young colleague you have always already introduced is the intracerebral hematoma. This is especially in uh, Europe where I am uh, a difficult topic because of the so-called stitch study. The stitch study believe to have proved that it makes no sense to operate intracerebral hematoma. And uh, I myself did never believe these results because the study has not been signed very well. And therefore, I am very eager to, to, to hear from the young colleague from China uh, how he is doing, how he is overcome this, this problem. Because in my own experience, I have learned it depends from the kind how you do it. And if you do it by minimal invasive techniques, you will have good results. So please go ahead and show us how you did this series of hematomas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Klaus. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks all the audiences and thank you, uh, Professor Rajan. And I'm uh, sharing my uh, it's truly an honor and my pleasure to share with the global audiences of our preliminary experience for the minimally invasive surgery. As I see it as described by Dr. Cross, it's really uh, one of the most devastating diseases uh, globally and there has not been a, a good treatment strategy. So damage from the ICH I think it's multidimensional from the initial mechanic disruption, slight matter, to the uh, uh, you know, multiple uh, secondary uh, injuries. So uh, the surgical evacuation always stands the ground. I did not agree with the stitch trial uh, together with you, Dr. Plus. I think surg surgical evacuation always stands a firm ground in the treatment of ICH because a timely evacuation and a minimally invasive surgery can provide, uh, can make the patient suffer less from the hematoma. And uh, looking back to the stitch trials, as you've described, they are sort of uh, uh, very serious study designs, uh, although they fail to prove uh, favorable outcome uh, benefit uh, compared with a conservative treatment. But the surgical strategy varied uh, greatly in these two studies, as they include a large decompressive myelectomy or a minimally invasive uh, puncture drainage strategy, they all considered as a surgery. However, I think the real milestone here for ICH treatment is a MISTI-3 uh, study. This study is a well-designed uh, RCT study uh, for a surgical treatment strategy. It's a phase three study and including 78 centers for, across four continents and enrolled patients with spontaneous ICH volume for three milliliter aged uh, for 18 years old. And the patients were randomized into PST and conservative treatment. And the primary outcome is one year MRS after the uh, onset. And the, uh, the groups uh, were pretty balanced. I, I think the highest, uh, it's one of the highest uh, quality or RCT studies concerning a surgical method. Uh, one key factor is that the treatment strategy procedure itself is standardized. Uh, uh, in terms of different uh, shapes of the hematoma, it developed three trajectories. One is for the anterior, it's for the pudement, uh, hemorrhage, and, uh, uh, another is from the 
rear sight, uh, majorly for the uh, deep seated uh, sediments, hemorrhage, and for the lower hemorrhage, uh, they use a lateral uh, trajectory. And they use uh, puncture and drainage, uh, whether on the, uh, the, you can use navigation or not. And after puncture, uh, first aspiration, then lysis, then drainage. So, and it defines a clear treatment endpoint uh, to a hematoma volume of treatment less than uh, 15 milliliters. Although uh, from the main results, uh, the MSD strategy did not increase femoral out outcome in uh, comparing with the conservative treatment, but we look further into the study, we can find that the technical success is not universal in this study. We can see that uh, fewer than 60% of patients received the treatment target, which is uh, less than 15 milliliter uh, hematoma after treatment. And so if we pick out these patients uh, who are qualified with the highest level of uh, technical success, we can, we can find that it, it is a true favorable benefit, uh, outcome benefit in these group of patients. And if we, uh, if a less successful treat, a treatment strategy, which is a uh, uh, threshold is 30 milliliter, and we can see a mortality benefit. And factors hindering technical success, including the initial volume, patient history, a irregular shape, and uh, uh, a lysis doses, and other factors. And this is a showcase of a typical technical success. We can see the catheter is along the main axis, and after treatment, a major, major part of the hematoma was developed. And unsuccessful cases uh, involving the malposition of the catheter tape and hemorrhage around the catheter and uh, the migration uh, of the catheters uh, and most of these, kind of these, these regions. So in light of the, this, kind of this study, uh, many efforts have been made across the literature by various researchers to optimize uh, Tip position. And this study uh, is from a Chinese a researcher. He used the, uh, the CFS, uh, CSF flow from the uh, hematoma, which was broken into the ventricle to facilitate the drainage. And some uh, researchers propose a second catheter for larger volume, uh, larger uh, volume hematomas. And other studies used uh, 3D printing uh, to make a uh, guided, guidance plate or robotic surgery to uh, optimize the uh, position of the catheter. But uh, obviously, this increases uh, this need of specialized equipment, specialized personnel, and may uh, produce extra fees. And another strategy, other than the puncture and drainage, is uh, endoscope uh, clearance, which can clear the uh, evacuate the hematoma at a single procedure. And uh, there are studies comparing uh, endoscope procedure with uh, puncture and drainage, and also with uh, craniotomy. Uh, they found out that uh, although the uh, puncture drainage procedure uh, has minimal injury, but its clearance rate is uh, less uh, is, is less good, okay. and it has the uh, highest rate of rebleeding. And uh, clearly, the uh, craniotomy, a microsurgery by a craniotomy, uh, can clear uh, satisfac uh, satisfactory uh, hematoma clearance, but the injury is the the biggest. So the endoscopic surgery uh, make a good balance of safety and high clearance rate. And uh, efforts for a better surgical, uh, surgical planning for ideal trajectory has been made, uh, such as uh, using navigation-based techniques 
like the virtual reality or augmented reality to facilitate the uh, positioning and the uh, trajectory making. And also various kind of uh, retractors uh, to minimize the injury to the brain tissue around. Uh, this is uh, the, I think, is a brain pass from the operation and other, uh, be it round or oval shaped, uh, that is all specifically made for such kind of a surgery. And this is a technique called scuba. It did, I think it's a very robust and a very clever strategy. It did not use uh, extra uh, of equipment. It just used endoscope and uh, aspiration devices. However, it can it, uh, its main strategy is to uh, irrigate the hematoma cavity to facilitate the uh, aspiration and uh, to prevent the cavity to collapse prematurely. And by irrigation, also hemostasis is achieved. So I think this technique is very useful. And uh, in our experience, we have borrowed the experience from this, uh, from this technique. And there are also multiple uh, specialized enhanced evacuate system, like an artifice or a system, they specially designed for the evacuation of ICH. And uh, intraoperative uh, ultrasound has been developed to uh, like to provide real-time mon uh, monitoring of the clearance of the hematoma. And also uh, some study of uh, some researchers. Uh, were able to uh, incorporate the the, DTI, the fiber tracking technology by MRI to the uh, surgical planning. I think this uh, work uh, in our institution is not possible because it requires extra uh, MRI uh, usage, extra personnel, and extra time for uh, imagery incorporation. But uh, uh, this work, I think, uh, if we can do this uh, in a timely fashion, I think it's uh, of uh, great value, maybe. And there are several ongoing studies uh, comparing uh, different uh, equipment, uh, the micro uh, minimal invasive surgery with kind of conservative treatment. As uh, the studies, I think, I believe, will be reviews. And back in our center. Uh, from the uh, stroke onset, usually the patient will call a one to zero. This is a government funded uh, emergency service. You will dispatch ambulance to the patient, and the, uh, the patient will be transfer, uh, transport, transported to a hospital. And during the transportation, the patient is uh, under charge of the paramedics. And the paramedic, during the transportation, they will contact our hospital, which is a stroke center. And if uh, the patient developed a highly likely signs of stroke, uh, we, are, we have a dedicated group called acute stroke team. We'll uh, meet the patient uh, to, at the first time, and they will make initial evaluations uh, to judge if it's a ischemic stroke which will be taken into a specialized uh, unit for the treatment. Or otherwise, if the stroke is hemorrhagic, it remains, the patient will be sent into ER for uh, initial management and evaluation. Uh, clinically, uh, majorly we focus on the blood pressure control as indicated from the uh, interact or uh, attached studies. We have uh, intensive blood uh, lowering uh, protocol and we are uh, well uh, actively find any risk factors for hematoma expansion, uh, reversal of the OAT and initial management of the airway. And also we will provide a radiological evaluation, majorly uh, contrast enhanced CT for uh, proper size of progressive hemorrhage and other regular lab investigations. And at the same time, the neurosurgical consultation will be notified and for a uh, further decision. And the patient will uh, be transferred into the NICU for uh, intensive uh, neurological uh, intensive care. And if stabilized, he will 
are discharged, they'll be discharged. And uh, during surgical environment, our surgical improvement, uh, radiologically, we have uh, no contrast uh, CT and contrast in pounds to CTA. And our navigation system is a uh, uh, regular electronic and brain lab navigation system. And for first few cases, we used uh, the uh, navigation system. After a few cases, we do not use uh, navigation anymore. We use, uh, just use a freehand style. And the endoscopic system is stores an Asculab uh, endoscope system. And the access to, uh, we call it endoport, uh, shaped round or over, whatever, uh, uh, just like uh, the pictures, but not exactly the same thing. So, and ours is a dedicated neurosurgical center. And uh, traditionally, the ICH patients were uh, treated by uh, our uh, senior chief resident. And the uh, surgical strategy uh, varies from uh, surgeon to surgeon, very uh, greatly. And uh, uh, endoscope approach was seldom uh, employed uh, uh, traditionally. And uh, uh, several years ago, we moved to a new uh, neurosurgical center, which has a uh, room and uh, devices. So uh, endoscopic surgery has been popularized since then. Um, but uh, we do not form a, a, a relatively fixed surgical strategy until recently. And I reviewed uh, the recent cases, mainly uh, IC education patients, etiology is hypertension, is uh, uh, consecutive cases I uh, found uh, in the recent uh, seven months, uh, 26 cases, and uh, uh, majorly male patients and been aged 60 years old, and the uh, pre operation uh, hematoma volume, uh, mean volume is uh, 60, uh, 46 milliliter. And after the operation, the mean value is uh, uh, 6.4 milliliter. So the mean clearance rate is a 60, uh, 86 percent. And we have no uh, re-bleeding patients after surgery and uh, no patient mortality. And this is uh, uh, the typical case of how we do it uh, in a free hairstyle. But this patient is a 45 years male. Is a, a serious case, a disease at six points, and showed signs of left uh, brain herniation. And we can see the hematoma is very large, and the midline shift is very significant with uh, intraventricular uh, ventricular involvement. So, uh, surgery is performed via a coronary incision, and uh, we used a uh, in a, a small craniotomy uh, with three uh, centimeters in diameter, and the entry point is selected at uh, three meter laterally to the uh, central center brain, and towards uh, the, the direction uh, directed towards the uh, external acoustic meatus. So after the evacuation of the surgery, we can we can see the uh, hematoma is. They're totally evacuated, and the ICP is controlled well. And a interventricular probe of ICP monitoring, uh, together with uh, EBD, is placed for the further evacuation of the interventricular uh, hemorrhages. So the patient is uh, sent uh, after surgery is sent into NICU uh, for uh, further treatment, and he is uh, uh, recovered. His uh, uh, afterwards, recovery was an event. So from see, uh, these several uh, cases, we learned that uh, first, uh, the main axis, the MISTI study uh, put em uh, emphasized the main axis to optimize the catheter position. But uh, we have to learn the, where the main axis through uh, the best is uh, visualize the hematoma in a three-dimensional way. If we look at the hematoma in three-dimensional, we will see that the main axis is not the main. If we only look 
the actual plane, the main axis, the main axis is always on the axis. But actually, in my experience, most hematomas, if we uh, visualize it in a three-dimensional three fashion, it's like just like a pancake or like a, a egg. Uh, different axes they do not differ much in the in the distances. So if we look in a three-dimensional way, we can see, we can choose, we, we can have uh, a better, we can have uh, 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 more choices for entry point and for the uh, decision-making of a surgical trajectory. This is our first uh, experience. Secondly, I think uh, why we just do not use uh, navigation anymore, especially in the emergency situation, because if we uh, master the rule of the key central plane, uh, most of the uh, base, uh, basal ganglion hematomas, the boundary will fall into this plane. Uh, this plane, why I call it uh, the key central plane, it is uh, parallel to the central central plane. It is a uh, one to 1.5 centimeter lateral to the corpus point, to the plane that crosses the corpus point. So uh, that is uh, three to 3.5 centimeters lateral to the central central plane and about two centimeter anterior to the coronal fissure, uh, which is uh, to avoid a smaller area. And usually we can direct the trajectory to the E external exotic hematis. And the distance from entry to the encounter of the hematoma is usually four to five centimeters. Once we uh, put the uh, port, the endo port, into the boundary of the hematoma, then, then the hematoma will be, uh, they'll follow suit. They'll, uh, they, they will follow one by one and you can aspirate it out uh, gently. And uh, similar works can be found in the literature. This is done by uh, Korean researchers. They also use uh, a central plane, which is uh, three centimeter lateral to the central and a direction uh, uh, which is very close to our uh, simulation. And there, uh, but they use uh, punctual and drainage fashion to make the catheter uh, ideal to the core of the hematoma. And they found that uh, this freehand style is pretty reliable and pretty accurate. And so after, like I said, after the port was entered the hematoma, uh, but in, in some cases, uh, the, if the patients Slow GCS, especially the hematoma is very large. Uh, after the mini acrinectomy, the, we found the dural as uh, the brain tension is very high. Then we shall we can use puncture first and to uh, drain part of the hematoma to relax the brain. Then to ease the process of uh, the induction of the end port. And, and by this way, we can minimize the. Uh, the injury uh, from the retractor to the brain. And after the, uh, the retractor entered the hematoma boundary, then uh, we can use a slow and steady way to aspirate it. Well, it just feels like the hematoma is squeezed out uh, by the brain itself. Then during the aspiration, irrigation is very important. And we can even uh, use, uh, we can even uh, dip the uh, tip of the endoscope under the water and make uh, inspections. And also during irrigation, the hemostasis is uh, will be achieved. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, learned from the scuba uh, technique. And during uh, these procedures, bipolar is not uh, most cases not necessary. And even in some cases with uh, brain herniation, because uh, traditionally in our center, if ICH patients show signs of brain herniation, like uh, 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 pupil dilatation, uh, we will regularly perform decompressive brain activity to help uh, 
to help uh, facilitate the ICD control afterwards. And, and this uh, trajectory is from the anterior uh, direction. Uh, for uh, a rear seated and a deep salamus hematomas, if the border, as a hematoma border lies within the trajectory, uh, this strategy is also helpful, as indicated in uh, this case. You can see this is a, a rear seated and relatively deep um, salamus left salamus hematoma with ventricle involvement. However, if we see it uh, on the central plane, uh, which I did not provide the picture, uh, the boundary of the hematoma just lies within the five centimeters of the on the uh, key central plane. So we performed the, the surgery. We just uh, uh, slightly adjusted the trajectory, made it a little bit more uh, posterior. Uh, toward it, and we entered the uh, hematoma boundary successfully. And then without uh, a lot of maneuvering of the uh, end of port as a hematoma, uh, just the brain just squeezed out most of the hematoma and uh, slightly adjust the direction. We also able to uh, found the entry point of the hematoma to the ventricle and uh, as rates a little bit of the uh, intraventricular uh, hematoma out. And then a, uh, from this incision, we can uh, make a lateral ventricle puncture to place a uh, ICV monitoring together with EVD for further drainage of the hematoma. And also uh, for this kind of patients, which is uh, a severe case, a larger hematoma, a greater uh, midline shift, and a lot, uh, and low GCS score, and with signs of uh, a brain herniation. You can see the initial ICP is very high, and through a, a very small craniectomy, first we puncture the uh, hematoma to relax the brain, then uh, insert the endoport and uh, clear the hemorrhage, and after carries, um, we see the brain tissue uh, collapsed well below the bone window, and the ICP is not high, so we do not uh, choose to do further decompressive craniectomy. In this case, if after the hematoma evacuation, the brain uh, swelled significantly, or the ICP is still very high, uh, we can still have options. We can use an N-shaped expansion incision to perform a uh, decompressive craniectomy. And, and uh, this is another information from the MISTI study. Also, we want to emphasize that is the importance of ICP. Uh, this is a study of a post hoc analysis from the original MISTI study uh, shows that if patients uh, with ICH, the ICP is not controlled and the CPP will be low, then the mortality uh, will be higher. And this is inconsistent with our experience that uh, we have uh, made a uh, cohort study comparing patients uh, with ICP monitoring or with not ICP monitoring. We found that ICP monitoring can provide information during the treatment for patients with GCS lower than 12, especially for those patients with GCS 9 to 12 points uh, in the in the ICP guided treatment, these patients, the six months GOSE is significantly uh, better than those without. So ICP uh, may provide valuable information for the management of patients uh, suffering from ICH. And those are uh, 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 techniques. Uh, uh, for successful, but we also have some complications. Although we have not uh, met any uh, patients, uh, patient mortality, any significant re-bleeding, but we do have some complications, uh, such as this case, which is uh, uh, this, there is no 
intraventricular involvement uh, initially for this patient, but after the uh, evacuation of the hematoma, we see uh, hemorrhage of the uh, inside the right ventricle. And we believe this is caused by uh, the process of uh, uh, insert, insert, inserting the endoport into the uh, hematoma and the squeeze the hematoma uh, uh, to force uh, the blood clot to enter the ventricle. So uh, during the operation, the careful the retractor should be maneuvered carefully, and when necessary, uh, a uh, initial uh, the first uh, puncture should be employed to relax the brain to uh, minimize this kind of uh, complication. And another patient, is, uh, which is a, a recent case, is a, a 40 years old female patient, is uh, hypertensive, uh, ICH, GCS is uh, 12 points. The uh, hematoma is around 40 milliliter. We notice uh, intraventricular involvement, and we can see from the upper right corner of uh, the two pictures showing uh, uh, several slices of uh, hyperintensity around the cerebral fissure. And we regularly uh, use, uh, use this freehand style uh, to clear the hematoma surgery when it's uh, pretty and eventful. We do not use any bipolar polarization. However, we can, uh, if we see the uh, post operation CT scan clearly, we can see that the left temporal lobe, uh, there is a vaguely hypo intensity region. And in the second day, this hypo intensity region becomes infarction and a midline shift uh, worsened. And also, the patient's uh, GCS uh, declined and ICP is high, uh, as high as 15 to 27 millimeter. Mercury. So uh, we used TCD to, to check the vessel uh, velocity. We, we, we see that the left MCA is significantly increased in velocity. And we also use uh, EEG and use autoregulation indices. And we also perform the CDA. We can see that uh, the vessel spasm may be the, the, the cause of this uh, infarction site. And so uh, luckily uh, in the NICU, we use uh, employee strategies for the vessel spasm to treat and for the ICP control the patients, but discharge them eventfully. So uh, as for these uh, experiences and these complications, uh, we should ask ourselves and whether our treatment method the best medical treatment is the best. And whether our minimally invasive surgery is truly minimally invasive. As we look into the whole process from the patient's onset of stroke to the discharge process, we can see that although surgery plays a significant role, but its role is still limited. And with it, within the whole process, I think the most important or the more than most uh, places with potential to perfection is the uh, uh, pre-hospital phase, the ER phase, and the MSU phase. And so looking to the future, I think during the pre-hospital and the ER uh, stage, we, have, we, can, we may develop better uh, identification tool uh, by on-site treatment tools such as uh, blood pressure management, airway management, to provide the valuable time to shorten the time from the, uh, the onset site to the surgical serum and the, provide our valuable time for the uh, surgical window to make uh, preparations for a uh, minimally invasive surgery. And, and we need to develop more uh, integrated uh, evaluation tool concerning the uh, clinical uh, radiological for uh, thorough planning of a truly minimally invasive surgery. And also better equipment design makes a better surgery. And I think 
for the most important thing, NICU care uh, will play an uh, irreplaceable uh, role for the patient's uh, true outcome. Because uh, with patients with lower GCS, uh, patients with uh, larger volumes, uh, the outcome is uh, very dismal. But uh, for this kind of patients, our NSU management experience is uh, lack. Most of experience or most of the ICP based management strategy is borrowed from the management strategy for uh, traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury patients. So we have, we still have a lot of uh, uh, space, a lot of room to better uh, in terms of NICU care. And as for closing, as uh, a recently published uh, article uh, for, for the advancing surgical treatment for intracranial uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, a study design and research directions. And the authors have listed uh, detailed recommendations for future uh, study design. Why is this important? Because what I'm talking is still experience. So the most important thing is to turn our experience into evidence that will change the health policy, will change the uh, treatment paradigm, and uh, ultimately will benefit the patients. And uh, for the recommendations, I think se uh, several recommendations are very I important. First, uh, we should define clear primary outcome. The primary outcome may cons uh, consist of three major parts. The first, a technical effectiveness, functional, second, a functional outcome uh, for a follow up as long as uh, 12 months and mortality. And uh, during patient selection, we should uh, consider possible confounders, be it clinical, be it logical, or other things. And during the, uh, for the surgical part, we should uh, repeatedly ask ourselves if our procedure is truly minimally invasive. Uh, minimally invasiveness should include uh, minimal damage of the brain, brain cover by small operation and uh, proper navigation and uh, respecting elephants, brain regions and minimum brain uh, manipulations and uh, retractless. So, and I think uh, through uh, the most important things is to develop future uh, studies and maybe a future milestone studies such as MST to establish the role of surgery for ICH patients. And this is our, our wonderful team. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this nice overall presentation of all your techniques and some results. Uh, I have some questions, some few questions. Uh, when do you start surgery after onset? How many time in average do you have after, to, after onset until you start surgery? And this varies greatly because uh, ours is the largest center in our city, and we do not, uh, we not only treat patient, local patients, we all we uh, treat patients from uh, uh, other nearby provinces or treat patients uh, referred to our hospitals uh, constantly. So, if the local patient as they live near our hospital, uh, this time window will be very you know, comfortable. Uh, from uh, It can be sent to our hospital within hours, within one to two hours, so we can meet the patient very quickly. And if the patient is transferred, the situation will depend. Because uh, um, I experienced patients transfer from eight hours of uh, drive you know, driveway, they just want to uh, reach our center. Like, uh, because, you know, in China, the medical resource uh, is highly, you know, uh, different in, from city to city, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, how long was the average, average duration of the procedure? How long is the procedure? Yeah, for, uh, 
uh, for in average, I think skin to skin is uh, within 90 minutes. Oh, very good. Yes, very good. And I have seen in only one slide I saw that you have used an ultrasound. You have used yeah, no. a bull hole, a bull hole probe, a ultrasound yeah. bull hole probe to monitor the, the, the process of evacuation. I have seen. Uh, do yes. you use otherwise the ultrasound or only in few occasions? Uh, actually, we do not use ultrasound in our center because we uh, uh, do not regularly use it. Um, we use ultrasound in the NICU setting uh, mm -hmm. for uh, you know TCD uh, things mm -hmm. like that, or for a volume evaluation. During the surgery, um, we seldom use ultrasound. Yes. And uh, how how do you clear the reason of the bleeding? the site and the reason of the bleeding because most young colleagues are afraid of sudden severe bleeding during the procedure so how do you how do you uh, define the reason of the bleeding yeah that uh... It, it's, a, it's a very interesting experience because during my first few attempts for such kind of patients, uh, I can see, I, I, intercount, I encounter a lot of cases uh, of uh, intraoperative breeding. Uh, and I believe uh, nowadays, I think it's uh, related to my manipulation uh, of the uh, either the suction or the uh, tractor maneuvering. And these bleedings are actually uh, very small. And if it not further uh, harassed, you know, it not further harassed vessels, it will, uh, it will stop if I just use uh, irrigation. And if, uh, so the fear, if, if I fear this kind of bleeding, so if I want to uh, do more suction to, to see where the bleeding comes from, or if I try to use a bipolar during the situation, uh, the result will maybe not uh, very, very good because uh, uh, the more harassment you do, uh, the more bleeding you will encounter. So uh, nowadays, uh, as I'm sitting here today, if I encounter some bleeding, I will just use irrigation. I will stop uh, suctioning and uh, uh, stop uh, useless harassment. You just, you know, irrigation. And uh, several um, seconds or even several minutes, the bleeding stops itself. Yeah. Because okay. uh, we, we seldom see large uh, vessels in the uh, basilar uh, ganglia region. Okay, thank you. Maybe there are other questions in the audience. Can I ask you a question, uh, Professor? Yes, yes of course. Yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I just want to find out from your experience, uh, because this, again, the AHA guideline, which tells that uh, for ICH, it's, it's, it's always safe to bring down the blood pressure uh, faster than a cerebral infarction. Uh, but in my opinion, in a large uh, ICH, it's always dangerous to bring down the blood pressure. It's better to go for surgery as early as possible uh, to bring down the blood pressure. My first question, what's your experience? Uh, my second question, if there's a large hematoma and a delayed surgery, it always associated with post-op cerebral edema or even infarction. In those cases, patient uh, delayed surgery, uh, we always anticipate the need of a decompressive craniotomy because they usually uh, associated with raised intracranial pressure, your opinion. My last question, Professor, do you have any experience uh, doing a, a endoscopic uh, transventricular evacuation of uh, thalamus uh, uh, bleed? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, first is concerning the intensive blood uh, pressure lowering. Uh, I think for most patients with uh, uh, relative high GCS and uh, relative not uh, that large hematomas, uh, it is safe, it is very safe to, uh, uh, according to the guideline, to uh, lower the ground pressure to a target region. 
um, which is a very uh, reasonable region from 130 to 140 millimercury of uh, SBP. Uh, however, for those uh, severe cases showing signs of brain herniation or extremely high initial blood pressure over uh, 200 millimeter mercury for these kind of patients, uh, we uh, do not uh, lower uh, blood pressure to the uh, uh, to that intensity to uh, 140, we just maybe 160 to 180. That is uh, overall, that is uh, will, will be fine. And because uh, this kind of uh, high hypertension mainly caused maybe cause a Cushing reaction. And if we uh, lower the uh, blood pressure too dramatically, and it will cause a, a dramatic decrease of the cerebral diffusion and may uh, worsen the secondary damage. Uh, this is my, my first question. Uh, secondary, uh, if, if I am doing decompressive craniotomy during the uh, procedure, if uh, we encounter uh, severe brain edema or raised intracranial uh, pressure. So uh, we, in my experience, if we do the uh, surgery uh, as soon as possible, uh, typically within the development of recognition, within one to two hours uh, within the development of uh, signs of uh, brain herniation. And most of these patients do not need decompressive craniotomy. However, for prolonged, for prolonged uh, brain herniation, uh, uh, DC is uh, still needed. And um, uh, so, in our center, we regularly use uh, ICD monitoring, uh, so we can we can use uh, objective uh, values to, to guide our as uh, second uh, if to guide if we perform DC or not. And uh, if we do not have the uh, ICD monitoring, we can just uh, um, uh, you know judge from the brain tissue the relationship of the brain tissue and the bone window. If after the evacuation, the brain tissue is still above or the tension is very high against the uh, bone window, then we will choose a uh, decompressive craniotomy. Otherwise, if the brain tissue is uh, very loose, the tension is not high, um, the brain tissue is below the, the bone, then we will not perform uh, DC. Uh, for the third question, if uh, salamus hematoma can be treated with an endoscopically, my question is, uh, my answer is yes. If a salamus hematoma, uh, I, I think uh, salamus hematomas can uh, differ from one to another. Uh, the one type of salamus, uh, they will burst into the ventricle, so the, the uh, uh, the hematoma in the parenchymal uh, is smaller than that in the ventricle. The major part is in the ventricle. Uh, another side, uh, they, they burst upwards or uh, anteriorly. And so this kind of hematoma can be treated for endoscope. Uh, endoscope. Uh, as I mentioned in my slide, if we if, uh, see it from a sagittal uh, reconstruction plane, if the boundary of the hematoma reaches the trajectory of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the uh, in, uh, of the endoport trajectory in the in the uh, uh, key central plane then we can uh, if if our you know uh, retractor if the endoport can uh, reach the boundary inside the hematoma then we can uh, help, uh, suck it out uh, use the self squeeze effect of the brain to uh, take the blood clot out. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take questions from Professor Hansu Wen and Takeaki Hara also. Professor Takeaki Hara, any questions from you? Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question. Do you do the angiography to all the patients? For uh, because sometimes we Asian patients have better anomaly, for example, moya moya disease and so on. So do you usually evaluate preoperatively uh, angiographical um, cause of the hematoma uh, hemorrhage uh, preoperatively or routinely or not? Yes, it's a routine uh, CTA. 
for CTA, the only CTA. Yeah, CTA. Irrigation. So we can, we can identify most of the uh, secondary hemorrhages from uh, CTA. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So is, uh, Professor Hang Wen, any questions from you? You ask me? Professor Wen? Hang Su Resh. Wen. Yes. Okay. No, no. No, no, it's from uh, Professor Wen. Okay. Uh, it's, um, I just want to congratulate a wonderful talk. And um, so actually you uh, you've, have abandoned the open surgery for evacuating hematomas. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think yes. if the result is very good, it's actually it's very good. So why not? I congratulate you for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. With that, we come to the concluding part of this webinar and I would like to invite Professor Klaus Resch to say these uh, remarks. Well, first of all, I'm very happy that uh, younger colleagues again operate intracerebral hematomas. Uh, this is very important. Also, it is important to keep the minimal invasive philosophy and strategy high which can be very fine done with intracerebral hematomas because they are benign lesions and not so difficult like for example aneurysms or tumors so this is a very good entity to to train very early the youngest in minimal invasive strategy i would recommend to everybody to train intraoperative ultrasound because one of the major issues we have not talked now in intracerebral hematoma is the pathophysiology. And the question Yashakil always was asking to us was, what is the matter with this brain having the, this lesion? What is going on in this brain? I want to know, I have to know. This can mostly be answered by ultrasound. In the last 30 years, I never opened the dura without making an ultrasound and answer this question. What is the matter with this brain? The fear of the youngest to face a sudden severe bleeding can be ruled out excellently by ultrasound. There are many small angiomas which you will not see by the CTA because of the pressure. So if you start to release the pressure, you should stop when the pressure is not too high anymore. And then you should make an ultrasound to see if there is an unexpected cause of bleeding. And you can localize and you can answer how, how uh, dangerous this bleeding might be. You can answer this by ultrasound. So please go ahead with this fantastic work and think about if you should not take the ultrasound uh, uh, additionally, because it is your private radiologist beside you during surgery, especially during emergency surgery. And you can find all of this in my last two volumes, key concepts in minimal invasive neurosurgery. Just now published in Springer. And uh, I congratulate you again, and please go ahead with this very worthful work. Thank you. Very Thank well you, said. Thank you very much. With that, we, I would like to conclude this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yoko Kaito, I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Hang Su Wen and Professor do Chuyo Ying, as well as the chairs, Professor Takayaki Hara and Professor Klaus Resch for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And today we have around 1,880 people who have joined us live. A special thanks to my co-host uh, uh, Liu Bun Singh for joining me today, as well as Ben from Hong Kong who joined us from Japan. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.